Hello everybody and welcome to another off the shelf board game review. This week we're going to do something a little bit different and we're not actually going to do a review. This week I'm going to take a little bit of time to look at a game that's available on Kickstarter from Mantic Games. Now that does mean that since this is on Kickstarter this game is not even available yet and it's actually still in its alpha probably approaching its beta rules right now. But that does mean that everything you're looking at here is basically stuff I cobbled together from taking pieces out of various board games that I own. Threw it together just so I can show you exactly how this game plays. Now the main reason why I'm doing this is, well, basically I wanted to try the game out before I backed the game to make sure it's something I wanted to back. And to be honest, I'm really starting to like Mantic Games. They're basically doing everything that I thought a Games Workshop should have done years ago but refuses to do, which means they're taking all those classic games I really loved in the 80s, taking games like Blood Bowl, moving them in the future, upgrading the rules, making them play just a little bit better, and bringing out games such as Dreadball. They're taking games such as the classic game of Space Hulk, giving it a new finish, creating a little bit of a new theme, and you basically have the game of Project Pandora. They've also taken the classic game of Necromunda, which was a fantastic 3D model game that allowed you to play in the third dimension, which was really cool back then. They took the game, upgraded the rule set, and now we have Dead Zone. At this point, there was really only two games left for Mantic to bring back for me to just make my childhood favorite games complete of the collection of games that I used to love, used to enjoy, used to have a heck of a lot of fun playing from Games Workshop. And let's be honest, I still actually own those games. I still play them and I still have a heck of a lot of fun with them. But it's just really cool to see them brought into the future, seeing the mechanics updated from what's more better from the common. Someone say even goes as far to say as a little bit outdated gameplay, update it, bring it into the future, add some better components, and make them so you can at least still play the games and see some expansions come out for them and see that they're still enjoyed today, which is something that Games Workshop wasn't doing, so seeing Mantic do this is really, really cool. So when Mantic Games announced Dungeon Saga, which, to be honest, looking at all the components, looking at everything they're saying, looking at everything over on the Quirkworthy blog, which is Jake Thornton, he's one of the big designers for Mantic, and if you know anything about Games Workshop, not to keep throwing their name back into this video, but just to give you a little history, Jake Thornton and another gentleman who worked for Mantic Games are actually both former Games Workshop employees, so they're actually bringing a little bit of that Games Workshop magic into Mantic Games. Now that I've gone completely off topic here, there were only two games left for Mantic to bring back for me to make me just throw my wallet at the computer screen. And they did it. Dungeon Saga is basically Hero Quest and Advanced Hero Quest Reimagined. Except the really cool thing is, looking at everything they're saying in the Kickstarter, they're basically going to have Hero Quest and Advanced Hero Quest in one single box, giving you all that cool gameplay, and looking at everything they're promising on the Kickstarter and comparing all this to Advanced Hero Quest, we're looking at a lot more stuff for a game that looks like it's going to have a lot more legs, a lot more fun, and I'll be honest, I love Dungeon Crawlers. They're my favorite kind of games. They allowed me to combine role-playing games and a board game into one thing and have a heck of a lot of fun with my friends when I was younger. So, this is Dungeon Saga. Now, since this is actually based on the alpha rules, and not to go into too many details, you can check out the Kickstarter and learn a heck of a lot more than I can blabber on for about, for about 30 minutes. Basically, you have the basic rules, which is Hero Quest in a box. If you ever played Hero Quest, a fantastic game from the 80s, which was a lot of fun, had a lot of good gameplay and a couple really cool expansions for it, but it was a little bit more simplistic, a little bit more basic, not really for the hobby market, it was made more for the mass market. And that's why Games Workshop had Advanced Hero Quest, which is basically the same idea of a game, a dungeon crawl, but made for the hobby market. So what Dungeon Saga is, is they've taken both those games, combined them into one box and given us two set of rules. We have the basic rules, which is pretty much the alpha rules that are available to the public right now. And then you have the advanced rules, which is basically the more complex rules, mainly for the more of the hobbyist player. The unfortunate thing is that those advanced rules aren't available to the public yet, and I don't have any inroads for me to be able to get a copy of those, but if I can, and if this is a video that you are all interested in seeing more of, I'll see if I hunt down those advanced rules and possibly do a video based on those advanced rules. Now this isn't going to be like my typical video where I'm going to teach you how to play the game, show you some gameplay, and give you a final review because, well, Everything you're looking at here is, like I said earlier, cobbled together from other board games and it's also just photo paper and my really terrible, terrible Photoshop skills going to work. So we're not even going to comment on that at all. And basically I've taken some miniature pieces from HeroQuest 
because just a little bit of nostalgia there. I thought it'd be pretty cool to throw in some Hero Quest miniatures in there. Plus, I got a couple of miniatures I threw out there. And I'm just going to give you a quick, rough overview of how the game plays. And again, remember, don't judge the rules too much on this because this is basically the alpha rules. They're still in transition. And not only that, this is the basic rules, not the advanced rules, which are going to be much more complex. You'll notice quite a few differences. Reading some of the blogs, I can tell you what some of those differences are, but I'm going to wait to the end of the video before I hit that just to avoid confusion. The way Dungeon Saga works, and there's multiple multiple different ways to play the game. You can play the game solo as the heroes versus an AI-controlled opponent who's controlled the Necromancer's forces. You can play the game as an AI-controlled where you actually play the Necromancer forces versus the heroes. You can play the game as a versus game where for two players, one person's controlling all the heroes and one person is controlling the bad guys. Or you can play a final way where multiple players will have one guy controlling the bad guy and then the parties can be split up among players. Or finally, you can have four players playing against an AI-controlled Necromancer player. So those are the five different ways you can play Dungeon Saga. I'm not going to confuse things by showing you all those different ways, especially since I don't have access to the AI decks, even though I really would love to because they sound really freaking awesome. So I'm just going to show you the basic gameplay of the heroes versus the Necromancer. Now there's a few pretty cool things that Dungeon Saga does that are going to be a little bit different than your standard dungeon crawler that I haven't seen before. Kind of, well, I've seen kind of close in Super Dungeon Explorer, but they do it just a little bit differently. You're gonna notice in Dungeon Saga that there's gonna be these little skull tokens all over the map. And basically what these mean is that the person who controls the Necromancer can raise these and they can do it using special rules. And when they raise them, they're gonna be replaced with a standard skeleton warrior. And you can use these to attack the players. The really cool thing on top of this though that is that if a player kills a skeleton warrior and doesn't do quite enough damage to actually completely destroy the skeleton warrior, where the skeleton warrior falls is going to be replaced by one of these tokens and then the necromancer player can on a later turn just raise a skeleton up and keep coming at the heroes and attacking them and basically wearing them down. So when the heroes attack these skeletons, they need to make sure they do enough damage to completely obliterate them so they don't end up as little bone piles again for the necromancer player to raise. Now I made one fine, well, okay, I made a terrible mistake the first time I actually recorded this video. And I went through and did a complete gameplay based on that, that play without realizing I made a mistake because it wasn't covered in the alpha rules. But the necromancer player can only have up to four skeletons summoned that way. You can't have six, seven, eight, nine through card play and kind of obliterate the heroes. It's not fair. I'd say, oops, but there's no evidence because I deleted the video, so I'm happy and I'm willing to continue on from here. Um, additionally, not only can you raise these, but some of these creatures, when they get destroyed, like these more powerful skeleton warriors, I'm sorry, these armored skeletons, and you have your standard zombies over here, and you have your evil revenant over here, and our four heroes over here. But back on point, when these skeletons right here, these more powerful skeletons get defeated, they're actually going to turn into these bone piles too if we don't do quite enough damage to take them out. So the really cool thing is if the players manage to knock one of these guys over but not destroy them, they're going to come back as these little skeleton guys right here. The bad news is for people who don't read the rules carefully or if a rule wasn't quite covered is you can't keep raising an entire arm of these guys to try to slaughter the heroes with. But I can tell you it looks really, really cool to have about 15 of these little scythe little guys coming out of the party of heroes. It kind of causes them to get a little stressed out. It was fun, I have to admit, though. Another really neat thing about this game, if you ever played Hero Quest, you know that the wizard and the elf both had a deck of spells. Their spell deck was basically one use. They fire off their spell and they basically discard that card. They never had access to it for the rest of the game. Pretty cool thing about this game is that the wizards have spells that are going to have a, call it a timeout or a recharge time or whatever you want to call it. Basically, we're going to cast a spell. We're going to flip it over for the next round because we can't use it. Then the following round, that spell is going to become usable by us again. Pretty cool effect that allows us to have a nice variety of spells where we're not agonizing over using spells. And it also kind of fixes the problem I had with Hero Quest with the original wizard, where once your wizard would cast all his good spells, he was basically a bait. You just threw him out there to go get killed because you didn't care anymore because he became next to useless once he was out of his good spells. In Dungeon Saga, what you can do is you can cast one major spell or you can cast two minor spells. You can't cast the same minor spell on the same turn, though. So it kind of hampers the wizard in this tutorial first scenario since we actually have one minor spell and two majors. 
and our miners break ward, which allows us to knock down doors and do damage to doors, or we burn things, set things on the fire, you know, your traditional wizard, blow things up in a big ball of flame kind of spell, pretty fun. Then we have Feet of Stone, which is basically we just make our enemies so they can't walk for a little bit and they get a little bit easier to hit. There's just two other minor points to cover and I'll just go ahead and get into the gameplay here really quick. The first thing is, is that all models block other models. You can't move through squares so the elf can't just hop through the dwarf right there to get ahead of him because the dwarf is doing what dwarves do and moving just a little bit too slow for the hyperactive elf. You can move diagonal though, which is kind of a nice thing. You can also step on top of these little piles of bones, which means if you do that, the Necromancer player can't resurrect those piles of bones on that turn as long as the hero stands on them. And finally, something that I thought is pretty darn cool, and I'm liking it so far, but I think it may be a little bit hampering for the elf who has his bow and arrow. I'm not sure, and some people may have seen too many episodes of The Lord of the Rings, but... If the elf happens to be in melee combat, he can no longer use his bow. So a tactic that the necromancer player wants to do is to get this elf into melee combat as quickly as they can so he can no longer use his bow because with his bow and his special ability, he can start laying out a rain of death across the board if you let him. Having said all that, I'm going to go ahead and just start playing the game, explain the rules as I'm going, and hopefully you'll like what you see. The very first scenario is pretty darn basic. The only thing that the Necromancer player has to do to win is to defeat one of these heroes. All these heroes have exactly four hit points. Once they take the fifth point of damage, they're crippled. They're taken out and the Necromancer wins. All the heroes need to do is break open the store. If they manage to do that before any one of them are defeated, the heroes win and the Necromancer loses the adventure. Now when you're playing the game, the way the basic rules work is the heroes' roles go first and then the Necromancer player gets to go. The Necromancer gets to activate a certain amount of models based on the scenario. And the first scenario gives us four models, plus we have access to three cards, which are going to give us special abilities. And now these cards are supposed to be held in a hand by the Necromancer player. So the heroes have no idea exactly which cards the Necromancer player has. Some of them are allowed to be played on the hero's turn, and some of them are allowed to be played on the Necromancer's turn. They give them extra special abilities such as the ability to raise extra models, the ability to move extra models, do pretty cool things. But again, they're the Necromancer's secret hand, and the Necromancer can only play one of these cards on the Necromancer's turn, unless they're an interrupt card, and then they can only play one on one of the hero player's turns in between their activations. So that's a really important thing. If I want to play this interrupt, oh, I don't have an interrupt. Oh, yes, I do. If I want to play this interrupt card right here, I have to wait till one of these heroes finishes their action, and then before the next hero starts their action, I play this interrupt, and I do what I need to do with that card. So we're going to go ahead and begin. Heroes start. They're going to do a move and then an action. They can't reverse it. In the advanced rules, it's a little bit different, but in these basic rules, it's move and then action, and you can move the heroes in any order you want. Once all the heroes go, it is the Necromancer player's turn. Before I go any further though, I made one quick little mistake a few months ago. I just want to correct myself and it's just because I've been playing another game recently. This is a standard zombie right here. This is an armored zombie, not an armored skeleton. Sorry about that. This is also an armored zombie. This is a standard zombie. These are skeletons. Again, if we don't do enough damage to defeat them, they may be knocked down, but they can be brought back to life by the necromancer player. And this right here is a dwarven revenant and he is also like a skeleton. He's a lot tougher, and if he's destroyed, he can actually be brought back to life as a standard skeleton. That's a quick little um, note that I definitely want to make, though. If the Revenant is defeated, he is not brought back to life as a Revenant. I can bring him back to life as the Necromancer player as a standard skeleton, not back to, brought back to life as a Dwarven Revenant again. One other quick point I should also make here is that the players need to get through these doors right here, which are going to lead to this room. When you play the game, you're not actually going to have this room set up. I just have it set up in advance to make things a little bit easier on me. So basically right now, just pretend this whole room section doesn't exist, and this is all that exists to our little hero's world. And all they know is that they need to get through these doors and somehow get to the store, even though they don't know it's there yet. We're going to go ahead and start our turn with a Barbarian player. Now remember the heroes start first, but they can start with any hero they want. They don't have to have their heroes go in the same order every single turn. They can switch it up depending on what's most advantageous for them. So we're going to start with our Barbarian player. And again, I'm not going to make super strategic decisions here. I just want to show you the gameplay for Dungeon Saga. 
we're going to go ahead and start with a Barbarian player and make a less than optimal move just so you can see what can happen when you're not concentrating and playing smart. So we look at our Barbarian player, we see that he has a movement of 8 and just for simplicity, all of our heroes except the Dwarf have a movement of 8. Diagonal movement is perfectly fine as long as your line is not blocked. And if we get to that, I'll show you exactly how it works, but it's pretty simple also. Start with the Barbarian player, we'll move 1, 2, 3, 4. We're going to end our move right there, even though we have movement left. Again, the way things go is move, finish all the move you want to make, and then go ahead and take your action. So again, we move four spaces, one, two, three, four movement. And then we're going to go ahead and attack this unarmored zombie because he only has one armor die, and we're hoping it's going to be a little bit easier to take him out, especially since we're at a penalty to our attack since we happen to be outnumbered. So normally our Barbarian hero would get four attack dice, but since he happens to be outnumbered, he's going to lose one. So he's going to get three attack dice. And we'll go ahead and roll those. And we're going to get some results. And then we're going to look at our unarmored zombie who happens to have one defense dice. So they get to roll one die. And what we're looking for here is we want to make sure that all these dice, all these numbered rolls, happen to be equal to or greater than the armor of our target. This is pretty easy to do here since our target has one armor and with a six sided die you can't roll less than one so we're actually okay here. Once we've done that we need to line our dice up in order from highest value all the way down to lowest value. And then we're going to compare these dice and see what kind of result we're going to get. So starting at the top with the highest die value we're going to see that the five defense of the zombie matches our five attacks. So these two dice are going to cancel each other out and they're not going to have any effect. Then we're simply going to go down the line looking for any dice that equal the armor or higher. And that's going to tell us exactly how much damage we did to the zombie. We're going to see that we have two dice left over that are not opposed. So we're going to do two points of damage to the zombie. Well, if we look at the hit point chart for a zombie, we see that it takes three points of damage to take out a zombie. Now, the really cool thing about Dungeon Saga is there's no upkeep for the, dun or for the Necromancer player. It's an all or nothing. Either you do enough damage or you don't. And in this case, we didn't. So we let a solid thud into the side of the zombie who shrugs it off and keeps moaning and moving on, trying to take out our helpless barbarian as the necromancer player says, oh, you're finished. I'm now going to play this card. Now this card is an interrupt card which allows the necromancer player to activate two models on the board that they like. And not only that, we can do this before the hero player gets to activate any more of their models and we get to have a little bit of fun and see if we can take out the barbarian player and maybe if we're lucky enough we'll get an early win and show how haste definitely makes waste here. So we're going to start off with the armored zombie just because we can and that's what we decide we want to do in this instance. We'll look at the armored zombie and see exactly how many combat dice he gets and the armored zombie gets two attack dice. And then our Barbarian, we see here he gets two armor dice in defense. Unfortunately, our Barbarian happens to be outnumbered, so he would normally lose one dice. Luckily for him, the rules do say that the minimum amount of armor you can ever have is two dice. And after that, you're just going to subtract one from your armor. So he's basically two dice with one armor. So we're basically going to have to take any results that we get. And hopefully the Barbarian doesn't go down from taking too much damage. So we'll roll for the attacker, which is going to be the zombie. And we're going to get a 4 and a 1. Not too great, but hopefully it's enough. And then the barbarian is going to also get a 4 and a 1. So we're basically going to compare the dice from highest to lowest. And we're going to see exactly what happens to our barbarian hero. Fortunately for our barbarian hero, they're pretty lucky here. Their 4 defense is going to cancel out the 4 attack. And their horrible 1 defense roll is also going to cancel out this 1 roll. So our Barbarian can stop sweating bullets, or stop sweating magic missiles since we're in a fantasy setting here, and wait to see what's going to happen when the second zombie goes and attacks him, or we can decide to do a different action because we can activate a second model for the interrupt. So for our second action, instead of just trying to tie down the Barbarian with weak, feeble attacks that aren't going to do much to us, and especially since our main objective here is to swarm the hero since we have weaker undead monsters who aren't quite as damaging as we want them to be. What we're going to do is we're going to activate this armored zombie and we're going to use it to cause a little bit of a bottleneck for our heroes because all of our heroes and all of our monsters have a threat hexes and they basically stop you from walking through those threat hexes if we're positioning them just right. 
So we're going to go ahead and activate our armored zombie here who has pins to have a movement of four. We're going to move one, two, three, and four, and we're going to position them right here, right in front of the dwarf. Now, the front threat hexes for our armored zombie happens to be this space, this space, and this space. And if this was a space, it would be here also. And also this space, and all these spaces right here are behind. The nice thing about doing this is that the wizard can't move from here and then go to here because you're not allowed to move through multiple threat hexes. The wizard could move here and then go right here though, but if they do that, they're going to suffer some possible other consequences. So just by the necromancer player moving this armored zombie to this position, we managed to bottleneck the heroes already pretty darn efficiently. Because once a hero moves into a threat hex of another model, they have to stop moving immediately. Which means if we move the wizard, they're going to have to stop right in this space. This also means that the elf can't move diagonally here because their line of sight is blocked by these two models. And also, other models block line of sight, so our elf hero can't even use his bow and arrow. So by moving this armored zombie here, we managed to not only bottleneck our heroes, but we managed to make it so the heroes have to make some pretty tough decisions that they may not want to make this early in the game. So just by playing this one card, the Necromancer players managed to move a little bit on top in this game of good versus evil. Our heroes have one option at this point. They have to hope that the dwarf can manage to take out this armored zombie so freeing up the rest of the heroes so they can do something this turn so the poor elf is not left wasting their entire turn. So the heroes are going to go ahead and take their dwarf, their mighty dwarf, who happens to have five attack dice. Yes, he does hit pretty darn hard. He's not outnumbering his opponent, so we're not going to get any penalties on the dice. So our dwarven hero gets five dice versus our armored zombie, who happens to get three dice in defense. And let's see what results we get. Now remember, we need at least three hits to take out an armored zombie. Otherwise, it's going to continue to laugh at us and continue to be a blockade. So we're going to roll our dice and see we're going to get a 5, a 4, two threes, and a 2. Now the 2 is not enough to beat the zombie's armor, so this dice is automatically going to be discarded. And the zombie's going to roll their 3 dice, and we're going to see that we're going to get all these results are higher than the 3 armor for the zombie, so they're all going to apply. The 6 will go against the 5, the 5 will go against the 4, the other five is going to go against the three, leaving us with one three unopposed. So we're going to look at these going down in order. The six defense is going to cancel the five attack. The five defense is going to cancel the four attack. And the five defense is going to cancel the three attack. The three goes opposed, but one point of damage is not enough to take out an armored zombie. So with a loud thunk, the dwarf's axe manages to hit the armored zombie. Put a dent in his rusty armor, but the beast still continues to cackle and carry on. Things aren't looking too good for our hero, so what's going to happen next is our hero is going to decide to bring out their big cannons. The wizard's going to go ahead and decide to take a blast of burning flame at the zombie, who is definitely within easy range, and our burn attack, since we're going to use the spell, it's going to have to go through a with recharge, but luckily it's a five dice attack, which is very, very nice. And, you know what, before we're actually going to cast our spell, we're going to move up. That way this poor little armored zombie is going to be outnumbered, so he's going to be at a penalty to his defense. Probably a little bit better strategy for a wizard and for a hero player, since we want this guy to fall pretty quickly. So we're going to get five of dice for the attack. Normally our armored zombie will get three dice for the defense, but since he is outnumbered, he loses one of the dice. And then we're going to roll and again compare results. We need at least three successes to take out this zombie. And any rolls not higher than his armor are not going to do any damage at all. So we're actually going to be doing pretty darn good here. Luckily the dice were in the wizard's favor. So the two is not higher than the zombie's armor. Neither are these two. So now we're just going to line up the numbers and compare them and see exactly how much damage we're going to do. We're going to have four dice that are unopposed. And that's going to be four points of damage. An armored zombie only takes three points of damage to take out. This armored zombie just happens to become incinerated. And he becomes cannon fodder for nothing because he's a zombie. He can't be resurrected as a skeleton. Things are looking a little bit better for our heroes. Unfortunately, though, the only thing left for the elf hero to do is to do a little jig as he dances back and forth between the squares. 
because unfortunately his compatriots are blocking his access because remember models cannot move through other models that's going to end the turn for all of our heroes it's now time for our zombie player to go and our zombie player gets to activate four models and play one card on their turn we're going to go ahead and start with one card right here that says raise three skeletons and we're going to happily go ahead and raise those three skeletons we're going to take these two skeletons right here and we're going to choose to take this skeleton right here now the reason why we're taking these specific spaces is if we raise a skeleton within line of sight and attack arc of any heroes those heroes are going to get some free attacks and we definitely don't want to make things easier on our heroes because we're a necromancer we're evil and that's how we are we're going to add three skeletons to the board and we still have four activations to take on our turn now the necroplanter player being an evil necromancer that he is decides that blocking our heroes and creating this bottleneck just happens to be working at least it worked on the last turn so we're going to go ahead and stick with that strategy so we're going to go ahead and start with this skeleton right here they get a movement of four we're going to move one two change facing which does not cost movement we just got to make sure that facing is very important here we're going to go ahead and land right in front of our dwarf and we're going to go ahead and attack our wizard now the skeleton is outnumbered so he's going to get a little bit of a penalty but again he's just there to slow down our heroes and if you do a little bit of damage he'll be a little bit happier just to get the free hit in our skeleton warrior isn't feeling brave enough to try to take out this dwarf who happens to have five armor i'm sorry four armor which makes him a pretty tough nut to crack especially when we only have two attack dice so our fearless skeleton warrior is going to go ahead and attack our wizard so our skeleton warrior has two attack dice our helpless wizard only has an armor of one so they're only going to get one die to defend themselves now normally remember if you're outnumbered you get a penalty but you can't be reduced to two dice or less than two dice for rolling and anything beyond that is just going to lower armor and since we're the attacker we don't care about armor at all so it's not going to matter in this instance so the skeleton is going to roll get double threes which is easily higher than the armor of the wizard so it's still going to take effect and then our wizard is going to roll the dice and he's going to get two things aren't looking good for our wizard at this point the wizard has an armor of one we're going to compare the dice so the three defeats the two which is going to be one hit and then the three defeats the zero or the nothing so we're going to get two hits in on our wizard now luckily this isn't one of those games where you can get multiple hits in on a turn it's either you do a point of damage or you don't or you defeat a model or you don't makes it a little bit easier on the upkeep so we have got in at least one hit so we're going to do one point of damage to our wizard hero now remember if any model on a hero side is knocked unconscious or crippled which means they've taken five points of damage the necromancer player has won we're one point of damage closer to the necromancer player winning it's now time for the necromancer to activate their second model the necromancer is going to activate a second skeleton movement of four one two three and we're going to go ahead and pick on the wizard again just because we're evil and that's what we like to do so again we're going to get two dice versus the one dice for the wizard we're going to roll and see if we manage to hit and we're going to get double ones which doesn't look that good but luckily the wizard only has one armor so we should be able to get at least one hit in we're going to compare the four beats the one so nothing's going to happen there the one defeats the nothing so the wizard is going to take an additional point of damage they have now taken two points of damage if they take three more points of damage the wizards defeated and our heroes lose and our necromancer player says two more activations on this turn first thing they're going to do they're going to try to block this barbarian so this barbarian can't rescue the heroes here so we're going to activate this skeleton as our third activation we're going to move and we're going to move right here and we're going to position ourselves like this that way we are effectively preventing this barbarian player from running over and rescuing his heroes we're going to roll the dice and see exactly what we get we get two attack dice for the skeleton the barbarian happens to have two armor so they get to roll two dice now remember they're outnumbered so while they get to roll two dice they only have an effective armor of one and we're going to roll our dice and see if we happen to do any damage skeleton player is going to roll terribly and get a two and a one and now remember the barbarian's effective armor value is one since he's outnumbered even though he gets two dice just because remember he is outnumbered barbarian player is going to roll and he's going to get a four and he's going to get a one the two and the four the defense cancels it out 
the one and the one, the attack is not higher than a defense, so that cancels that out. No damage to the Barbarian, but that's okay. Remember, the goal for the Skeleton is to block this Barbarian in. We've activated three models. We still have one more model to activate, and we're going to have our Armored Skeleton go ahead and attack our Barbarian again. And remember, he gets two attack dice versus the Barbarian's two defense dice. All of our dice are above the Barbarian's effect of one armor right now because he is outnumbered. So we're going to compare the dice. We're going to do four is greater than the six. Five is greater than the two. That is two hits of this armored zombie versus our Barbarian. Now remember, you can't do more than one point of damage. All you need to do is find at least one hit. That's going to be one hit versus our Barbarian. If he takes four more points of damage, he's defeated. Luckily, the Barbarian doesn't take a penalty for being wounded. Unfortunately, our Wizard does. That's four activations for a Necromancer player. We draw a card, see what cool card we get, and that's going to end the Necromancer player's turn. Let's move on to our heroes, see if they fix things that aren't looking like they're going well for them at all. Our beleaguered heroes need to take care of this bottleneck that's really affecting them, and they know their big hero of the day is the Dwarf, who happens to have the most attack dice, because he's just a really cool Dwarf, unlike the Barbarian, who is not too smart by running into the thick of things. So we're going to start with our, bar, our Dwarven hero who's going to attack this skeleton right here in the hopes that he can clear things out so this wizard can get out and unblock the elf. At least that's our plan for our heroes. So the dwarf gets five dice for his attack. He's not outnumbered by the enemy so he gets all five of his dice. The skeleton being attacked is not outnumbered and the defense for a typical skeleton is two dice for his defense. So we're going to roll our dice and see exactly what results we're going to get. We're going to line up our dice and hopefully this is actually going to be one of those times we are actually going to take out an enemy model because we really need to at this point. So we have our five attack dice. We're going to compare them and see exactly what kind of results we get. The six attack is going to be canceled by the six defense. The six attack is going to override the four defense, so that's going to be one point of damage. A second, I'm sorry, not a point of damage, a one hit, a second hit, a third hit, and a fourth hit. Now remember, if we only do one hit versus a skeleton, nothing's going to happen. If we do a second hit versus a skeleton, he's going to return to a pile of bones. If we do a third hit or a fourth hit or a fifth hit versus a skeleton, he's going to be completely obliterated. And that's what's going to happen in this instance. He's not going to return as a bone pile. That skeleton is defeated. That's the end of our dwarves' turn. We now get to pick our next hero we want to act. Our heroes decide that they're going to go ahead and move the wizard next. The wizard's going to move from here to this space right here. And since we left a threat hex or a threat square controlled by one of our necromancer players, the necromancer player gets a free hit against our hero, which is possibly going to do a point of damage, especially the way we've been rolling lately. So hopefully the wizard can survive this damage. So we're going to look at what we have here. This skeleton right here is outnumbered, so we get the minus one penalty, which isn't going to matter because it goes to their defense, and we're the attacker, so not a problem. We're going to roll two attack dice, and the wizard's going to get one defense dice, and we're going to compare results and see exactly what's going to happen. The five is going to cancel the three, so not a hit there. The one is going to go uncontested, because the wizard only has an armor one, so it's still going to get through. That means the wizard's going to take one more point of damage, meaning they can only take two more hits before the heroes lose. So the heroes need to start playing very, very smart. But luckily, the wizard was smart enough to bring along a potion. They're going to go ahead and take that potion right now, healing one point of damage, so things aren't looking quite as bleak anymore. The wizard's other major spell is going to go ahead and recharge. That's going to end the wizard's player's turn. And now we have to decide exactly what we want to do with the barbarian and what exactly we want to do with the elf while trying to keep our wizard alive and hopefully not getting him surrounded because he could basically be our Achilles heel right now, especially if the necromancer happens to have any good cards. Now remember, our heroes have no idea what cards the necromancer player has. So we need to play really, really smart unless we want to lose really, really quickly.
The hero players decide that they're going to head and activate the Barbarian, and the Barbarian's going to turn. Now before, he had a penalty to his backside, he also had a penalty because he was outnumbered. But his armor is so low, his penalties were so low, it didn't really matter there. But just for the sake of looking really, really cool, and the fact that we're going to go ahead and activate our special attack, which is going to look much, much better if we're facing all of our enemies, we're going to go ahead and use our special ability. Now normally when you use your special ability, you're not allowed to move at all, but that's why I specifically said we're doing it just to look pretty darn cool. We're going to go ahead and use our special ability that allows us to attack every model around us in a, as long as they're in an adjacent square. And the cool thing about the special ability is it even allows us to attack models that are behind us. And what it's going to do is it's going to allow us to make a four dice attack against every single model around us. And we're going to go ahead and start with this skeleton right here. So we get four dice to roll. The skeleton we know has an armor value of two, so it's going to get to roll two dice. Now unfortunately our hero happens to be outnumbered, so they're going to lose one dice from their roll. They get three dice to roll versus the two armor of the skeleton. And remember, they need to get at least three hits to destroy it, two hits to turn into a bone pile, one hit means nothing's going to happen. We're going to roll all of, our, all of our dice, and remember we need all three of these dice to be successes, and we need all two of the other dice, the armor dice, for the skeleton to be failures. And hopefully we'll be able to take out a model, and we're not going to have much luck at all. We're going to get a 4, a 2, and a 1. A 1 is not enough to be ahead of the skeleton's armor, so that's going to disappear. 4 defense is going to cancel out the 4 attack. 4 defense is going to cancel out the 2 attack. Nothing's going to happen to the skeleton. Luckily, we still got attacks against all these other monsters that we're trying to take out. So again, we have three dice. We're going to go ahead and ta target the unarmored zombie with our three dice. We're going to look to see that an unarmored zombie happens to only have one defense dice. We're going to roll everything, see what kind of results we can get, and hopefully get some better results this time. We're going to get a 5, a 3, and a 1. Now remember, the armor of the zombie is only 1, so that die is still going to be valid. The 5 is going to be greater than the 2. That's going to be 1 hit. The 3 is greater than a blank. That's a 2nd hit. The 1 is greater than the 0. That's a 3rd hit. Remember, zombies can take 3 hits before they're destroyed. That's 3 hits versus our zombie. He is destroyed and removed from the board, and we still have one more attack to make from our special ability. Of course, the odds are stacked against us versus this armored zombie because we have three attack dice versus three defense dice. Hopefully we can take out that armored zombie. I'm not betting on it, though. We're going to line up the dice and compare the results we get. Anything less than a three is not going to be valid, so the defense of a two is not going to work. This attack of a 1 is not going to work, so we're going to basically just compare results and see exactly what's going to happen. Now the 6 attack is greater than the 5 attack, that's going to be 1 hit. This 5 attack is greater than the 3 attack, that's going to be 2 hits. Unfortunately, zombies take 3 hits to take out. And while we're going to put a nice dent in this rib cage, it's not going to take it out, and we're going to be stuck facing that zombie in a future round. The hero players only have one hero left, and that's going to be the archer. He gets to attack with four dice versus the skeleton zombie, or I'm sorry, the skeleton warrior, who only has two defense dice, so it's going to be four versus two after we move and make sure we're in line of sight and make sure we're in range, which we can easily eyeball and see that. So we get four dice versus two, and since this skeleton right here happens to be outnumbered, his effective armor is actually only going to be one in this instance, even though he still gets two dice. We're going to roll the dice, and then we're going to line them up, and hopefully we're going to get some better results because we really, as the heroes, need to start taking out some of these undead because things aren't looking too good for us right now because we're outnumbered and surrounded. The six is going to outnumber the four. That's going to be one hit. The 4 is going to be greater than 3, which is going to be a second hit. The 3 and the second 3 are also going to be 2 more hits. That's going to be a total of 4 hits with our bow and arrow versus the skeleton. That's going to do 4 hits versus him, which is more than enough to not only turn him to a bone pile, but it's also enough to destroy him, removing that skeleton from the board. And again, he's not going to turn into a bone pile because we did enough damage to take him out. That's all 4 of our heroes activated. That's the end of the hero turn is now the turn of the Necromancer player. 
The Necromancer player wants a win and they want an early win, so they're going to be a little bit of a bully and see if they can pick on the wizard and hopefully that's going to give them their win. They're going to go ahead and play a card that's going to allow them to raise one skeleton. They're going to take this skeleton right here and they're going to raise them. And now again, remember, we're picking that square because if we happen to pick the skeleton bone pile right there, when it raised up, the dwarf would get a free attack and that's definitely not something we want him to do, especially with his five attack dice. That's the use of our card. We now have four activations left. And with those four activations, we're going to start with the zombie who's going to move one, two, three, and he's going to move four, ending up right here in front of the wizard, and he's going to attack. He's a standard basic zombie, and the standard basic of zombie gets two attack dice. Our poor wizard only has an armor of one, so he's only going to get one defense dice, and hopefully he can avoid taking any damage. The 6 is greater than the 3, and the 1 is greater than the nothing. That's going to be a total of 2 hits, which is going to be 1 point of damage to our wizard hero. And now the skeleton is going to activate. 1, 2, and then they're going to move finally 3, turning their facing to face the skeleton, or the wizard right there, and they're going to go ahead and attack. Now remember, the skeleton warrior, just like the zombie, they get two attack dice versus the armor one of the wizard. We're going to roll the dice and see if we manage to get one more hit in and do a little bit more damage to our hero. A six and a one is going to be one hit and a one versus nothing is going to be a second hit. And now remember, even though he's outnumbered, the minimum amount of armor he can get is one, so nothing else can be minimized beyond that. It's still going to be a hit to our wizard who has now taken four points of damage one more hit on the wizard and he's defeated and the necromancer player wins the game. Now actually looking at things, I think we can actually win the game right here and right now as the necromancer player because the barbarian, while I was playing around earlier and saying that he turned around to do a special attack, he really wasn't allowed to turn his face in because you cannot move at all if you're using one of your special abilities. So the barbarian is still facing this way, which means this skeleton right here can freely move because he's not in one of the front arcs of our Barbarian to prevent him from moving. So the Skeleton can move one space right here, land in this space, and get one attack versus our Wizard with two attack dice versus the one defense dice for a Wizard. We can potentially win the game as a Necro player right here, right now, and let's go ahead and try to do that. Two attack dice for the Skeleton, one defense dice for the Wizard, we're going to get a 5 and a 1. The wizard's going to get a 1. The 5 is enough to be greater than the 1 to get 1 hit. The other 1 is going to bypass whatever's remaining for a second hit. That's going to be 2 hits. That's going to be 1 point of damage. And we'll drop that down on our wizard. 5 points of damage. Our wizard has been crippled. The results for this scenario say is if any hero is crippled, the necromancer player wins. We've crippled a hero. The Necromancer player has won the scenario. I hope you enjoyed this playthrough of Dungeon Saga. Again, this is just a playthrough using components that I scrabbled together from other board games. If you're interested in this gameplay that you saw, check out the Kickstarter. The reason why I did this, well, I like Mantic games and also because I want to play through the rules and see just how much I like the game. And if I like the rules enough, I'm going to back the game. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm back in the game. I'm actually in for, I think I'm up to $120, $125, because I'm getting the extra mission pack that gets you the goblins, the orcs, and the trolls, which is going to give you more story, more quest, and extra adventure packs. And for me, that seems like the best deal because I have tons of models. I'm not going to go full in for the models, but if they start offering some really cool furnishers, or furnishings and furniture, I'll probably go in for a lot more just because... I want to see how cool this board can be, and I want some nostalgia from Classic Hero Quest on a really cool, really fun dungeon crawler board game. Now, just a little small segue here. I was showing you the basic rules only. I can tell you that there are quite a few differences with the advanced rules. For example, in the advanced rules, it's not move and then perform an action. Basically, every hero is going to get two actions, and you basically do whatever actions you want to do. Movement will be an action. So from my understanding with the advanced rules, what I could have done is I could have attacked and then moved, which would have stopped the heroes from getting that bottleneck, which they did. Plus, it didn't help the fact that I was able to get a really good card play in the beginning, which kind of gave the Necromancer player a pretty good advantage because I was able to move in there and bottleneck them. 
And that will definitely is not something that will happen with the advanced rules. Also from reading quirkworthy.com, which is the website for the designer of the game, and also from reading the comments on the Kickstarter, I managed to glean the fact that there are going to be eight scenarios that come with the basic game. Those are basic scenarios, and then there's also the advanced rules, which there's not much known about except for some things you can glean from going to Quirkworthy, reading down, and he gives a couple hints of some of the things that are going to be forthcoming, but not too much detail. Hopefully more will be forthcoming soon. What I do know from the basic rules is that the heroes are going to level up, so they're going to become more powerful, and the wizard's going to have access to more spells. They're going to get better gear, better equipment, better stats. Stats. The Necromancer player is also going to get access to more powerful undead, more powerful creatures. And I'm hoping more cards, but I don't know that for a fact. It's just basically a hope and a desire on my part of things I'd like to see in the final game. Now again, this gameplay was based on the basic rules, but just to tell you what I like so far about the basic rules, and again, this isn't going to be a review. Please don't expect a full review from me here. I'm just going over what is available for the public right now. One thing I'm liking about the game is I'm liking the simpler gameplay. If you watched any of my videos, I'm sure you know how important gameplay simplicity is for me because I love to play games with my kids. And I love a game that's fun and challenging, but also not so challenging that my kids can't play it. I have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old. They love playing games with me, and I enjoy playing games with them. It's a lot of fun. We have our favorite games like Super Dungeon Explorer is a very popular one with my youngest one. And my oldest son really loves Galaxy Trucker, so that gives you an idea of what complexity level of games they really, really like. I like how this game isn't super complex. I like the fact that they're offering AI so I can play the game with my kids. We can play as the heroes and attack an AI dungeon, which sounds like a heck of a lot of fun and something that's me right up our alley, especially since we went through Mice and Mystics and it's basically boxed up since we beat it and we haven't pulled it back out yet, even though we had a lot of fun with that one. We had a few negatives with that one with the fluctuating hero count, which is something that we're not going to have a problem with here, so that's pretty darn cool. I'm also liking a little bit more advanced gameplay for the Neko player. I'm liking the secrecy of the cards. I like how that adds a little bit of extra power to the bad guy player, giving you a few extra surprises up your sleeve to throw at the heroes. I like this concept of resurrecting the bad guys, and I like how the fact that if you don't take them out completely they come back as another bone pile that allows you to add to your army for the bad guys i think that's pretty darn cool i like how some of the bad guys once you defeat them and unfortunately our heroes didn't make it that far but if they would have taken out the revenant right here he could have possibly came back as a skeleton if they didn't do enough damage to completely destroy him i think that's a pretty cool concept also I'm also liking the combat. It's kind of a little bit more complex than your typical game where somebody's just going to roll some dice and somebody else is going to roll some dice and you're either going to get skulls and shields if you want to compare it to classic hero quests. It's a little bit more involved than that, but not so much more involved that it becomes too obtuse and doesn't make sense to the people playing it. Basically, it gives you a chance to feel like you stand a chance. Uh, of course, unless you're the wizard with his one armor, but he's a glass cannon. and it's kind of expected. That's how wizards basically are. Probably wasn't the wisest move for me to move them out the way I did, but again, I'm trying to show the gameplay and give you an idea of how the game plays. There's one other thing, though, that you didn't get to see with the rules here. Basically, potions magically teleport from hero to hero, and it's something I'm kind of wishy-washy on so far. I like it in a way because I like it how it can protect heroes who happen to have a little bit of bad luck and need to heal really, really quickly. Let's say the wizard carries one potion and then you have another hero carry another potion. The wizard uses up his potion. He's kind of in trouble and he needs another potion. Otherwise, he's going to die. You know, the gauntlet. Wizard needs food badly thing. I like the fact that if another player is carrying a potion, they can use it on whoever needs it the most, which is kind of a nice touch. But I'm not liking the realism fact because it reminds me of kind of a super dungeon explorer where one person can use a potion on somebody else. Not quite sure how I stand on it, but I can see how it works for the balance. And again, all these comments are making I'm making here are basically based on the basic rules, so who knows how those advanced rules are going to work. Honestly, though, if you guys like this video and if I get enough feedback on this video, I'm going to go over to Quirkworthy and hopefully try to start hounding Jake Thornton and maybe Mantic Games, and hopefully I'll get a little bit of a bone thrown my way and maybe I can get a little more of those advanced rules, maybe at least talk about them or see exactly what they're throwing out there for beta test, and I'll throw up a video based on that too. This has been another off-the-shelf board game, not quite a review. 
Thanks again for watching.